Amen. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our special service before Thanksgiving, where we're going to do what we do pretty much all year round, and that's give thanks to the Lord. A special welcome to Harvest Riverside as well. Uh, we're one church, multiple locations. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that you have saved our souls. We are thankful that you've given us life. We're thankful that we're here right now in this place, worshiping you, calling on you, and we're thankful that we live in a free country. God bless America. Thank you for the great freedoms we enjoy and far too often take for granted. We ask your blessing now in this time as we open your word. We commit it to you and then also bless our time of worship and communion together as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you can all be seated. Well, big day tomorrow, Thanksgiving. Yeah, gotta love that Thanksgiving meal. How many of you like the Thanksgiving meal? You like it? How many of you don't really like it? Not everyone does it. Well, you don't like it, get out, because that's un-American. No, seriously. Uh, of course, you know, it's the early celebrations of Thanksgiving were quite different than what they are today. Uh, I read that actually they would have eels as a part of their diet, which is pretty gross. And I even read that they ate eagles, which to me means sac seems sacrilegious, considering our um, bald eagle, the significance it plays in our nation. And I emphasize the word bald because that's the important part of the eagle to me. But uh, I don't know about you, but I love stuffing. I love uh, mashed potatoes. I like gravy on everything. Uh, we, Kathy, my wife, does a special little thing with sweet potatoes and melted marshmallows on them. You ought to try that. Those are very good as well. And of course, turkey. A little cranberry. A little cranberry is nice on this side. Especially if it doesn't have the lines of the can in it still, right? It's even better if it's a little bit fresh. And then the turkey. Uh, I prefer white meat. How many of you like white meat in the turkey? How many of you like dark meat? Right. How many of you like the drumstick? That's very, That's a big, gnarly drumstick. You know, that could be a weapon if necessary. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, there's only two drumsticks per turkey. I heard about an industrious farmer. I've told you this before, but, but he, you know, he wanted to make more money. And he said, I've got to figure out how to produce a turkey with more than two legs. So in his experimentation in his laboratory, he actually came up with a turkey that had six legs. Someone said, that's incredible. How did it taste? He says, I don't know. I could never catch the thing. Because six legs, you move quickly. These are the jokes, people. I, have, I don't have anything else for you. But uh, if you brought your Bible, and I'm sure you did, I'd like you to turn in it to two passages, Psalm 100, and also we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 11. And the title of my message is, How to Have a Happy Thanksgiving. How to Have a Happy Thanksgiving. So tomorrow we celebrate Thanksgiving. And you know what's so great about this is it's a uniquely American holiday. It doesn't commemorate a battle or anyone's birthday or an anniversary. It's a day literally set aside with the specific purpose of giving thanks to God Almighty. Don't believe what the revisionists tell you. Many of our founding fathers were very committed Christians. Not all of them, but many of them. And even among those who were not strong in their faith in Christ, they believed the Bible was the word of God and they had a respect for God and they understood that God gave us this great nation. And so a day was set apart by our first president, George Washington, to give thanks to the Lord. Now fast forward to today, we don't even know what to do with it now. For many, it's just this thing that's sort of in the middle of two big things we've managed to monetize, starting with Halloween. Did you know that on Halloween, Americans spent $8.4 billion, an average of $89 per person? And of course, at Christmas, around $486 billion will be spent purchasing presents, etc. But Thanksgiving is sort of in between. Uh, it's an altogether different kind of bird, no pun intended. And for many, it's just that little thing where we get together and stuff ourselves before we go shopping till we drop, right? Because it's all about Black Friday now. You see a lot more promotion for Black Friday than you do for Thanksgiving Day. In fact, uh, traditionally, 
Stores used to be closed on Thanksgiving Day, but now many of them are open. We don't even call it Thanksgiving on many occasions. We simply call it Turkey Day. But I can tell you it's not a good day for turkeys at all. But what is Thanksgiving about? Well, originally, as I said, it was a day set aside to give glory to God. But for the Christian, every day should be Thanksgiving minus the turkey. Otherwise, you're gonna weigh a lot. But to every day, we should be giving thanks to the Lord. We should have an attitude of gratitude. In fact, studies have been done that have, been, that have revealed that when you have an attitude of gratitude, your health will be better and you will actually live longer. A study was done that revealed people that gave more gratitude toward God and gave thanks for what they had, had less heart issues, they had less aches and pains, and it affected their outlook on life. Dr. Robert Emmons of USC Medical School said, quote, gratitude blocks toxic emotions such as envy, resentment, regret, and depression, which can destroy our happiness. So, end quote. Interesting. So let's see now what the Bible says about thanksgiving. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be reading from Psalm 100. And it's identified actually as a psalm of thanksgiving. So read along with me. Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Powerful Psalm. There's a lot there. Psalm 100 was originally given to the people of Israel. And we're looking at them together. Of course, in our series on Moses, we're about to see how they're finally delivered from Egypt and they make the very long trek through the wilderness, ultimately arriving in the promised land. And the Lord said to them, when you enter into the promised land and settle down in your homes and you have plenty to eat, don't forget me because I led you out of the wilderness and brought you into a land flowing with milk and honey. And this can happen very easily to us as well. You know, when we're in trouble, when we're facing crisis, oh, we call on the name of the Lord, don't we? But when things are going reasonably well and the bills are paid and everybody's healthy, and we have food in our stomach. Oh, we can start to forget about God. So the Lord is saying, I want you to remember to give thanks to me. They needed a reminder, and we need a reminder too. And we're gonna have that reminder at the end of the service uh, tonight where we receive communion together. That's a reminder that Jesus gave to us. He said, drink of this cup and eat of this bread. And why should we do it? He said, this do in remembrance of me. We all need reminders in life. I have a reminder on my finger right now. It's my wedding ring. It reminds me I'm married. There's also a woman that's been sleeping in my bed for decades too. That reminds me. But, but apart from that, I have this ring. Now this ring does not come off. Not because, uh, well basically I can't get it off. I need the jaws of life to get it off now because I've gained weight since I put it on. No, I can actually get it off. But you know, and I don't really need a ring to remind me I'm married, but it is something that is there as a little reminder. And we might set an alarm to remind us to get up at a certain hour of the day. Or we'll ask someone, hey, remind me to do this. Or don't let me forget to do that. So this is a reminder. And who is this addressed to? Verse five, to all the earth and to all generations. So this is not just addressed to Israel. It's addressed to all people and to all generations. It's to young people it's to old people, it's to people in the middle. It's to the greatest generation, the baby boom generation, the baby busters generation, uh, the millennials, and of course, Generation Z. It's to all generations. But I want you to notice something now about this psalm of praise. The message of giving thanks is given to us and not a word is said about things. Nothing is said about things. In verse one, you find the word Lord. In verse two, again, you find the word Lord. Same with verses three and five. So here's a takeaway point. Our rejoicing on Thanksgiving Day and really every day should not be based on what I have materially. It should be based on who I know. 
Again, this is not based on what I have. It's based on who I know. Why? Because possessions, they come and go. Friends, they come and go. So does time. And in time, even your health fails you. But God does not come and go. Jesus comes and he stays. And I love what it says over in Hebrews 13, 5. It says, let your conduct be without greediness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You know, there's gonna be so much pressure put on you right now to get the perfect gift for someone else. And for others, you're hoping someone else will get that perfect gift for you. But I bet you can't even, even remember what you received last Christmas. But it was such a big deal before that, but so much of our focus on getting this thing and that will bring contentment or, or that will bring me what I'm really seeking. But God says, no, let your life be without greediness. Be content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. It's like David wrote in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. And if you're always wanting, 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 I'd have to ask the question, is the Lord your shepherd? So this is a focus now on what we should be doing this time of the year. And there are five Thanksgiving commands. Five Thanksgiving commands. Here's Thanksgiving command number one. Express your praise to God openly and loudly. Express your praise to God openly and loudly. Verse one, shout to the Lord. Let's just do that together. Let's, let's say mm, hallelujah on the count of three. One, two, three. Hallelujah. <laughs> let's try it again, but twice as loud. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Ah, that's good. That's shouting to the Lord. Isn't that great? And we rarely shout to the Lord, or we'll shout at our team, or we'll shout at the television set, or we'll shout at each other. But how often do we shout to the Lord? Actually, it could be translated like a trumpet blast. The Bible tells us in Psalm 47, 10, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. So really what we're told in the Bible to do is verbalize your praise to God. Just as you have to express your love and affection to your husband or wife and to your children and to your parents, so you should direct your praise to God verbally because he wants to hear you say it out loud. You say, well, doesn't God know that I love him? Yes, he does. But we're also told specifically in scripture to verbalize our prayers and our praise. Hebrews 13, 15 says, offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And that's important because there are times that I don't wanna shout praise to the Lord. I might be more in the mood to shout at God my complaints. But I'm told to do this and sometimes it is a sacrifice to bring my praise to God, but I should do so anyway. And so that's Thanksgiving command number one. Thanksgiving command number two is to serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Look at verse two, that's what it says. Serve the Lord with gladness. Every Christian is called to service. Sometimes I think we falsely think that there are certain people that are, quote, called to ministry, end quote. Oh, they're called to be a pastor. That's their job. Oh, they're called to be a missionary. That's what they do. Or they're called to be a worship leader. Or they're called to hold a job over at the church. Well, no, that may be true, but every Christian is called to serve God because God has given spiritual gifts to every believer. Uh, we're all uniquely blessed by the Lord with special talents and gifts. There are natural talents that God gives us. Some people are naturally athletic. Some people are naturally uh, clumsy, aren't they? Accident prone even. Some people are talented and they can perform music, they can play instruments. Other people think they're talented and they can perform music, but actually they can't at all. Some are artistic. Some are good at crunching numbers. Some people sort of are big picture people. Others are small picture people. But everybody has certain talents that God has given them. But then there are supernatural gifts that the Lord gives to us as well. Spiritual gifts, they're called. 
And we're to find those gifts, develop those gifts, and use those gifts in the church. In fact, over in Romans 12, uh, verses six to eight, Paul writes this, and you can turn there with me if you want, but it says, Paul writes, in his grace God has given us different gifts to do certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, then speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, well, be encouraging. If it's giving, then give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, then take that responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Notice that phrase, do it gladly. Do it with joy. You know, some people make serving God such a drag. And I don't know why. I love doing what I do. Uh, I love to study, I love to preach, I, I love to encourage people. This is a passion from my heart. It's not merely a job, though it happens to be that in some sense as well. But to me it's a privilege to serve God in any way that I can. But some people take things that I think can be filled with joy and make them sort of a drudgery. You know, I've told you before, I have two imaginary characters. One is named Bobby Buzzkill. And uh, he's married to Debbie Downer. And uh, wherever they go, they just have a storm cloud brewing over them. So maybe you're sitting around the table having a good laugh. And so Bobby Buzzkill says, you know, really, we, we, ought to be, we ought to be praying right now. Let's just pray. Well, that's a good idea. But did you have to say it that way? But it's just the way they deliver it. Uh, a while ago, I was uh, over visiting our church in Maui. And I went to a little restaurant I like there. And uh, they have a great burger. So I went in and... Uh, and I was standing around trying to decide what I would order. I noticed, I noticed someone ordered a hamburger. Some guy, and I, I walked over to him. I said, that's a good burger, isn't it? And he, he was getting ready to eat it. And he said, yeah. And then his wife said, wait, are you Greg Glory?" And I said, yes. She said, my husband isn't a Christian. <laughs> and uh, in fact, he, he, he really is misled and deceived. And I wonder if you would just speak to him right now. The guy's just holding his burger. She was Debbie Downer for sure. I actually felt sorry for the guy. You know what I did? I just kind of pat him on the shoulder. I said, God bless you, man. Enjoy the burger. And I walked away. I thought, there's a time and a place for everything. And that lady did not set me up for success. <laughs> Don't be that person. When you serve the Lord, do it gladly. Don't do it as a mere task or as drudgery. Or do I have to? Do I have to read the Bible? Do I really need to pray? Oh, to church again? Didn't we do that last month? Are we going again? That's not right. No, we serve the Lord gladly. The Christian faith is a happy faith because it's a hopeful faith. Because we have hope in this life and we have hope for the afterlife. We just had Randy Alcorn out last Sunday and he's just such a wonderful guy. And he reminded us that uh, God wants us to be happy. And he reminded us that we serve and follow a happy God. And that is given to us many times in scripture. In John 15, 11, Jesus said, I have told you these things to make you completely happy as I am happy. I love that. Because we don't think of Jesus as a happy guy. We think of him as sort of a sad guy, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as Isaiah 53 says. But that was describing how Jesus felt when he was about to carry the cross and bear the sins of humanity. But he wasn't always a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was a smiling person, a joyful person, a happy person, the happy God. Point number three, Thanksgiving command number three. You're a sheep. So follow your shepherd. You're a sheep. So follow your shepherd. Verse three, acknowledge the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. It is God Almighty who made you. It is God Almighty who sustains you. Everything you have, every breath you breathe, Every beat of your heart is a gift from God. I love how this says, we are His. We are His. The Bible says that we are His workmanship created for good works. 
And that word workmanship comes from a Greek word poema where we get our English word poem from. So I want you to think of it this way. You are God's poem. You are God's painting. You are God's song. You are God's sculpture. And you are a work in progress. So it's a beautiful thing to think about that, that I'm someone that God is working in and through. But just so you don't get too high-minded, then I'm reminded also that I am also his sheep. Now we don't have a lot of interaction with sheep in our culture today, but uh, back in these days there were sheep everywhere. <laughs> People were very familiar with sheep. And there was one thing universally known about sheep, and that is that they're a relatively stupid animal. So when God says, you're my sheep, that's another way of saying, you're kind of an idiot. <laughs> yes, you're my poem. Yes, you're my song. Yes, you're my painting. Yes, you are my masterwork. But then again, you're my sheep. So you really need the shepherd. Sheep are relatively unintelligent creatures, skittish, easily frightened, slow to learn, <laughs> prone to stray, and totally dependent on the guidance and protection of the shepherd. A sheep can't even protect itself. They don't have sharp teeth or claws. They can't even run fast. They're basically leg of lamb for the taking. They ought to just carry mint jelly around with them. You know, it's just, they are dependent upon the protection of the shepherd. So here's what it's simply saying. You're his sheep, and if you're a smart sheep, you'll follow your shepherd. And a smart sheep knows that the shepherd is always looking out for them. In other words, if God tells you to do something in his word, you know he says it to you because he loves you, right? And if God tells you not to do something in his word, you know he says that because he also loves you. He's looking out for your welfare. As Jesus said in Luke 12, 32, fear not little flock, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Thanksgiving command number four, we should be an active part of the church. We should be an active part of the church. Look at verse four. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Now in the Old Testament, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, they had their tent, also called a tabernacle, and they would worship God there. Ultimately, they built the temple in Jerusalem, uh, ultimately built by Solomon. And uh, there they encountered God. They would go into that inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, and there was the Ark of the Covenant given to them by God as a symbol of his very presence. Well, we're in the new covenant now. We no longer have to go into a temple to find God because the Bible actually tells us that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Lord now lives inside of us but the thing is, is this is a command to worship God with his people. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. This is something we're doing together. And I think that you know, because you're here at church right now tonight, you understand that God manifests his presence in a special way when his people gather together. Jesus said, when two or more are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. I mean, right now, think about this. Jesus Christ is here. You might say, well, Greg, isn't he with me when I get in my car? Yes. Isn't he with me when I arrive at my house? Again, yes. Well, isn't he with me wherever I go? Yes, it's all true. But what I'm saying to you is he manifests his presence in a special way when God's people gather together. The Bible tells us that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. So let's summarize what we've seen together. Number one, in the Psalm of Thanksgiving, we are to express our praise to God openly and loudly. Number two, we are to serve the Lord with gladness. Number three, we're a, we are a sheep, so we should follow our shepherd. And number four, we want to be an active part of his church. And now I want to come to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23 and close with the time that Jesus gave thanks. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. He writes, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. And on the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and underline this phrase, he gave thanks to God. 
he gave thanks to God. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. This do to remember me. In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. So we'll stop there. So Jesus was God. And because he was God, he was omniscient. And to be omniscient means you're all-knowing. Do you wish you were all-knowing? I don't wish I was. I think it'd be kind of depressing to know everything, to know the future, to know everything about every person, to know what you really think about me at this very moment as I stand here. You know, can he stop now? I'm really bored, I don't know. Or what, what do we really think? Jesus knew everything about everyone. He knew Judas would betray him and he said so. He knew that he was about to be betrayed and he talked about it. He knew that he would be beaten with a whip and he predicted that. He knew he would be delivered to Pilate and over to Caiaphas and back to Pilate. And he knew he would be crucified on a cross. He knew it all. And so with complete understanding of the future, it's amazing when we read these words, on the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God. Wait a second, Jesus, how can you give thanks to God knowing what is in your future? Surely you would recoil, and in a way he did. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. But he gave thanks, why? Because he knew what was about to be accomplished. He knew if there was no pain, there would be no gain. If there was no cross, there would be no glory. If there was no sacrifice, there would be no forgiveness. He knew it was gonna be hard, but he knew what it would accomplish, and so he could give thanks. Hebrews 12 says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Know this, when Jesus went to that cross, he was thinking of you. He was thinking of you. Well, Greg, is that really even technically true? Thinking of me? I mean, there's a lot of people in this earth, uh, past and present and in the future. How could he be thinking of me? Well, newsflash, God can think about more than one thing at one time. He's very good at multitasking, actually. So yes, he loves the world. It says God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But then Paul writes, he loved me and he gave himself for me. So in a very real sense, when Jesus went to the cross, he was thinking of you by name. Thinking of you, worshiping him. Thinking of you in a relationship with him. And that was the joy that was set before him. He had to go through that valley, through that pain, but he knew what it would accomplish. Therefore, he gave thanks ahead of time. And you can do the same. Because right now maybe you're in a, a situation where things aren't making sense and, and you're, it's hard for you. And there's a lot of uncertainty, but you can still give thanks. You can give thanks because God loves you. You can give thanks because God is in control of your, li in control of your life. You can give thanks because God is good. You can give thanks because ultimately he will work all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But Greg, I don't see the end yet. I know you don't, but you can still give thanks because God does see the end and ultimately it's gonna be good and you'll thank him later. But until that day, you can thank him now. Give thanks unto the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. It doesn't say give thanks to the Lord when you feel good. because Sometimes you feel good and sometimes you don't. Yes, Jesus gave thanks ahead of time because of what he was about to accomplish. And he was gonna die there for the sins of the world, for your sins and for mine. And so here's what Jesus says. So here's what I would like you to do. I'd like you to remember what I did. I'd like you to remember my sacrifice. I would like you to remember my death. I would like you to remember the whip that hit my back. I'd like you to remember everything I gave up for you. Remember, remember. Do this, says Jesus, in remembrance of me. There's nothing supernatural about the bread you will hold in your hand. To be honest, we bought it at the supermarket. It's matzah, you'll recognize it. There's nothing supernatural about the juice in your cup. It's grape juice. 
but it represents God Almighty. It represents the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ and it represents his shed blood. We don't believe in transubstantiation here at harvest, meaning we don't believe that the bread turns into his flesh and the juice turns into his blood because that's actually not taught in scripture. But we do believe that it represents the Lord. So there's a sacredness about it, not in the object, but in the one that the object represents. But yet at the same time as we receive these elements, uh, we don't have to do it as though we're at, at someone's funeral service. And I bring this up because Jesus says, this do in remembrance of me, and a better translation of that would be, this do in affectionate remembrance of me. So there can be an affection and a joy and a happiness in it, as in, Lord, thank you for your sacrifice, which was so perfect and so complete and you satisfied the righteous demands of the Father in heaven that I sinned against. Thank you, Lord, that uh, I have access to you now. So before we uh, receive communion and continue in our worship, I, I would like to just say, if you don't have this relationship with God yet, you can have it right now. We've talked about hope. We've talked about happiness. We've talked about all that God does for us. But this is something that is for believers only. Only a Christian should receive the elements of communion. You might be here visiting and thinking, well, you know, it's a religious ritual and maybe a little religion would do me some good. Listen, you don't need a little religion. You need a lot of Jesus. And so you want to do this as a follower of Jesus Christ. And in all honesty, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, as these elements pass by, I would just let them pass by until you're ready to believe. But when you believe, by all means, Receive this bread and drink of this cup. But this is something that only a Christian should do because Paul actually warns us later on, hey, if you eat this bread and drink this cup in an unworthy manner, you actually eat and drink judgment to yourself. So you don't want to do that. You want to believe and know God in a personal way. And, and I wonder right now before we receive these elements if everyone here, everyone listening to me, watching me, has this relationship with God? Does Jesus Christ live inside of you? Do you know that if you were to die today or tonight or tomorrow, you would go to heaven? And if you don't know that, why don't you make a commitment to Jesus right now? He died on the cross for your sin. He rose again from the dead. Now he stands at the door of your life and he knocks. And if you'll hear his voice and open the door, he will come in. And if, you ever, if you've never done that, why don't you do it right now as we close in prayer. Let's all bow our heads. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. And Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and laying your life down for the joy that was set before you. And I pray now for every person here, if there's anyone that does not have a relationship with you, if there's anyone here that is not certain their sin is forgiven, if there's anyone here who does not have the confidence that they will go to heaven when they die, or they've not found that meaning and purpose in life that we found in you, Lord, we pray that this would be the moment that they believe and receive Jesus into their life. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, maybe there's somebody here that would like to ask Jesus to come into their life and forgive them of their sin. Someone that would like to begin this relationship with him. Or maybe there's someone here that has fallen away spiritually, but you want to return to the Lord. You want to make a recommitment to him. You can do it right now. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. And you can just pray this prayer after me. In fact, you could even pray it out loud if you like, wherever you are. So if you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that when you die, you will go to heaven, if you want this relationship with God, just pray this prayer. After me right now, just pray, Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, but I know that you are the Savior. And you died for my sins on the cross. And you rose again from the dead. I'm sorry for my sin, and I turn from it now. And I choose to follow Jesus from this moment forward. In your name I pray. Amen. God bless you that prayed that prayer. And God heard that prayer and answered it as well.